Okay, so chances are you have heard me talk about feeding my dog raw goat's milk before. Like, I talk about it all the time, all the time. It is one of my absolute favorite things to introduce to a dog or a cat who is new to fresh food or even someone who just doesn't know about it. And that is for a very, very good reason. Today's guest is who I credit with introducing me and thousands of other people to the incredible benefits of raw goat's milk. If you don't know who he is by now, that's okay. I'm going to tell you in just a minute. But before I do, we are going to learn about raw goat's milk, why it is so incredible for our dogs and our cats and humans, by the way. There's so much surrounding goat's milk that you're going to learn about. We are also going to talk about vegetables and how they are beneficial for our dogs, for us too, but for our dogs is the context of today's episode. So if you haven't figured it out already, today's guest is none other than Billy Hochman. I am so excited to have him on the show today and Oh my goodness, we just, we chit chat and we get caught up and talk about everything going on in his life, his family, his beautiful wife, beautiful daughter, his dog Huckleberry, and some of the challenges that he has actually faced (laughs) with this new dog in his life, which is very interesting because fortunately for the world, Billy is such a science nerd, which I love. It is challenging him to explore new things and learn new things for his new dog, Huckleberry. And the world literally benefits when Billy learns something. So we talk about all of this and more. One of the great things about Billy is that you do not want to miss a second of what he is saying. Not only do you not want to miss a second of what he's saying, you want to re-listen to whatever he says at least two or three times because he has so many nuggets of wisdom, you might miss it the first time around. So whether you're driving or doing chores or you are literally sitting down to listen to this episode, you are going to get so much great information for raising your pets. And I promise you, you're going to want to listen to it multiple times because he just has that much great information to share with you. So Let's get into today's episode with none other than Billy Hookman from Green Juju. Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. So that's where she currently exists. And (laughs) like if we're playing Play-Doh, I'm like, you wanted to do this. I don't understand what... um, but she's generally really happy and she's starting to put sentences together and, you know, it's just a, it's just a really fun experience. You know, I know we're just trying to soak up as much, you know, little maple as possible because it's such a short time and, you know, you don't, you only get that first five years is, is, you know, that's, I think it's just the most, I have a feeling, I don't know this, but I have a feeling it's going to be the best time of my life. And so, um, you know, we're just, we're just trying to live that out and her and Huckleberry are becoming fast best friends and, um, we're switching her bed soon. So I think it's going to be my, my dream is that they would sleep together. And I think that would be the cutest thing in the world. Uh Um, right now she sleeps with a stuffed pug that she calls Lua. So also adorable. (laughs) Oh my gosh. No way. That is too cute. I mean, we told her it was Lua and she has a blanket um, with pictures of Lua on it. And so she, um, so that is very cute, but it'll be even cuter when it's Huckleberry. So. Oh, I am. I'm so glad I'm not the only person in the world that buys and uses those blankets that have your pet's pictures on them. (laughs) Oh, well, I actually got it as a gift from Kelly, the owner of Green Juju. So um, right after I came on, because 
I had set up the job before I started on June 1st, but I had set up the job before uh, Maple was born. And so um, that was on May 1st. So I think it was like in the middle of the month or something. But luckily it was really nice because, you know, I had a transition period um, of about a month. And so she was born on May 1st. And so I had the whole month to, you know, live the most insane month of my life, which was, you know, I was like, I'm always like, oh, I got the month off. But off is not an apt way to describe when you have a newborn baby, which is the most (laughs) crazy I swear like a week after every parent is like, what did we do? Like, why did we do this? Um, because it's so hard, but, um, you know, everything's mm. worth it, worth it for sure. So I bet it is. I was thinking, I like kept thinking of things I wanted to talk to you about. And one of the things that I wanted to ask you was like, as a dog trainer specifically, I'm constantly confronted with people who are rehoming their dogs or they're, they're, they're calling me because they're like, I need to make sure my dog isn't going to attack my baby or we're going to get rid of the baby. So like how you manage that, how you manage being like a a really good pet parent while also being a really good, like human parent. (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, that would be really interesting to ask Billy about. (laughs) I mean, I don't know why, I guess with some dogs, you, you do have to kind of like worry about that thing. I would say with most dogs, I don't think you do. I don't, I think that they, in, unless you have an, a reactive dog or like a, an aggressive dog or something like that, you know, I don't see why you would sort of think that they would be bad around the baby. I mean, I had a baby. I probably, I don't know if I'd recommend this, but I have, I have a toddler and a dog that's less than a year and a half old right now. So we had a baby and a puppy, which is in some respects really cool because of the fact that they get to grow up together and be, you know, just a few months apart in age. And, uh, but, now, I mean, of course there are times. So I, I've seen this a lot myself. And what I think happens in a lot of cases is somebody gets the dog and then they have a baby and then all of a sudden they're not able to, to donate, uh, to donate, to, to give as much time to their dog for, for at least a short period of time or whatever it might be. Um, but that's, I think, normal and natural in that relationship. And to me, your dog would rather stay in the family and not be walked as often for a season, you know, um, to be able to do that. And so for us, and, and we know too, that there's a lot of obvious health benefits when it comes to bacteria and, you know, introduction and, and, you know, good bacteria in a dog's gut and kids having less allergies and, you know, less asthma symptoms on that level for it. But as soon as you start to sort of like watch their relationship blossom, you know, between them, I don't know. I posted something on Instagram recently and I was like, if you have a child and don't have a dog, like you're really missing out on some like magic. Cause it's just so cool to watch them, you know, to watch her call uh hockey, her best friend. And you know, that it's just, um, although sometimes it's kind of funny because, the other night I was trying to like get her to say me and I was like, well, who's your best friend? And she's like, mama. And I was like, who else? And she goes, mama. And I was like, who else? And she goes, mama. And I was like, all right, fine. Uh, I'm chopped liver. It's, it's hucky and mama at this point. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I think, I think people have that general worry, but dogs are, you know, we've bred and conditioned them to love humans for like, you know, tens of thousands of years, I feel like. And, um, Maybe it's not that long. I don't know how long dogs have been domesticated, but, um, and they bonded first over why humans bonded with wolves in the first place, which is food. You know, it it took about one feeding session before Huckleberry was waiting at the bottom of the uh, high chair. And now she like, you know, (laughs) she actually asks in the high chair now to get, have treats so she can throw them down to him. Um, and so, I think, you know, they're going to be fast friends. And I I don't know. It's weird because there is a difference. Like, I will tell you, I, you know, I, Huckleberry is just an, a goof and an amazing dog. And he's definitely the family dog versus the relationship I had with Lua or Emily had with Lua, which was more individual. But I will tell you this. I was having a, well, this is my best way to sum up parenthood. And I never really thought I would, um, 
think you never think you'd think this way about your partner necessarily, but, and I know Emily feels exactly the same way, but I was thinking about like, as soon as I had a child, I just started worrying all the time. And you, you think to yourself, like, what if something happened to Maple? Like, you know, and it's just something that's in the back of your mind, I think a lot of the time. And, uh, I, I was thinking about that and I was like, no, if something happens to someone in this family, it's me. It has to be me. It's like hundred percent has to be me. And then immediately my mind was like, and if it's not me, it's definitely Emily. So I was like, cause it can't be Maple. And so I was like, you never think you're going to think that way about your partner, mm-hmm. but it's this sense of just, at least in my experience, it's just a sense of, I don't think I've ever loved anything more, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I don't know. I'm kind of over the moon, moon about it, um, obviously. But um, I think a dog, obviously I love dogs and I could not have a dog, but I just think it enhances the experience. I, I, I think our family dynamic would be so much different without Huckleberry. And I think that like, I think Huckleberry is going to be Maple's Lua. And I think that that's like an amazing, you know, I'm kind of getting choked up talking about it, but I, I think that that's really amazing. And I wouldn't, I never had any pets growing up. I never had a single dog or cat or anything like that. I think we might've had like a parakeet at one point, but, um, and so the, for me to be able to provide that for her, I think is just amazing. It is. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up Lua because I was like, should I, should I not bring up Lua? Because I think the whole world owes a huge debt of gratitude to Lua wherever she is right now because she changed your life and she put you on this trajectory, right? Like you are, you're doing what you're doing because of her. (laughs) I feel like. Yeah. She, you know, it was interesting before, before I met Lua, um, I can't remember how old I was, maybe in my like, maybe like 20 mid to early twenties. I can't remember. I turned 40, uh, in April. So I'm a little bit, uh, frazzled about that, but, um, no, (laughs) I made it. I, I did a thing with, um, uh, Dr. Katie Woodley last night and I made a joke about how I'm, I sell the lip ring and I'm about to turn 40. So I'm clearly uh, trying to hold on to my youth over here. But, um, No, I got her at a time in my life when I didn't really have a lot of direct, I didn't really have any direction and I didn't really have, uh, I was one of those people that just didn't know what they wanted. So they weren't really passionate about much of anything. And so when, when she actually passed away, so she passed away, um, in August. And then, so we did, uh, it was actually her mind that gave out. So it was, um, not, she went on, I mean, a couple months before that, she went on a five mile hike. Like she was in very good shape. Um, but you know, it was, it was a slight sort of like the story of the slight cognitive decline. And then all of a sudden they kind of hit a wall. And so we had someone come into the house and Emily was holding her and, you know, and, and um, we were all there and, um, it was, uh, so Lou passed away. And then, so I actually, knew I wanted to take her back to my family's, my sister lives on 80 acres in Wisconsin. So we, I actually wrapped her up and put her in my freeze, chest freezer and then went to super zoo for like a week, which is actually a really good experience because people understood you know, a little bit about what I was going through there. And then when we came back, we actually drove to Wisconsin with a four month old baby um, and Lua in a cooler in the back all the way to Wisconsin so we could bury her because I wanted her to be part of, she's buried in her favorite spot on my sister's land. And, it's part, and now you can see like, she's got a little stone there, but the grass has grown over, you know, where she's actually buried. And she's part of that now. She's like part of the, where, and we always go out there every 4th of July and stay at the house and stuff. So she's out and I can kind of like see her. But I remember when, uh, bless his heart, my nephew, dug her grave and it was like um he almost had a heat stroke doing it but uh so him and my uh brother-in-law they dug her grave and i actually had some friends come out um some some really good friends of mine who own a store in illinois um jeff and chris do own pug and hound um 
Apoc up there. Why can't I say that word right now? It's okay. They've been on the show before. <laughs> oh, there you go. So you 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 know Jeff and Krista. Yeah. They are some of my very best friends, and um, I'm Bruce's godfather. And um, so they came out, and and also Bella, who um, was Lua's best friend. She didn't have she didn't play with dogs or toys at all. Really, she just kind of hung out, but. Bella, who's a black pug who passed away last year, um, was like her best friend. So Bella was there and my friends, uh, Bella's people were there, but we were, I said, I tell this story to say that we were walking, I was walking back with my brother-in-law to actually get Lua. Um, and I said, you know, a lot of people wouldn't do this for a dog. And he said, uh, it's not an understatement to say that this dog saved your life. So it was a very, um, and I would say that's a hundred percent true. Cause like I said, I was very directionless. And then it just, it was a moment where I got her and I walked into a pet store and I said, what do I feed this dog? And it never, it's still to this day is 90% of what I think about on any given day. You know, I, my job outside of my hobby outside of green juju is nutrition. It's essentially all I think about. And so, she allowed me to, you know, pursue this amazing career. And I feel absolutely lucky every day I was in, like, I immediately, I will tell you the last job I had outside of the pet food industry was being a general manager of Starbucks. And I immediately quit and started working at a dog daycare so I could like be with Lua during my like normal work day. But I remember in 2000, <laughs> I think it was 2006 or 2007 being like working in this daycare and just, just caring so much about nutrition. I couldn't afford to buy books, but I could afford, I could afford to uh, drive out to Barnes and Noble and just open all the books and take notes and sit there and, you know, do that aspect of it. But I remember thinking in 2006 or 2007 at this daycare, like, I would love to do something with nutrition and it would be my absolute dream to be able to kind of like travel around and teach people about nutrition. And, you know, for me personally to have sort of surpassed that in that, you know, I get to make products. I mean, I get to develop pet food products. That's like, how cool is that? Right. In terms of um, that aspect. And I, what I think it generally genuinely shows is that anyone can do it in terms of if you have enough passion you can, you can do this. And what I mean by that is like, I'm a college dropout and I have one semester of college and the information is there if you want it. And what I really think if, if I had to place like what I think I do well in the industry, it's trying to push the nutritional envelope and innovation and think of new ways about, because it's very easy to formulate products if you're just kind of doing a version of something else that's already on the market. So that's what, that's what I try to do. That's what brought, that's what really attracted me to working with Kelly because she's really the same way in terms of that. We fit together really well. Yeah. I am. Um, I'm glad that story went on a little while because I needed to compose myself. I was so crying. <laughs> like, don't, don't cry. Jessica, don't cry. <laughs> um, <laughs> because it is so emotional. Like I care about more often than not, I feel like not being a parent, I care about my pets more than I care about myself, mm -hmm. which is silly. Like I have to care for myself to be able to care for them. Right. I get all that. But, um, yeah, it's just, it's so emotional to think about what happens and the pets we've lost. And I'm just so, so grateful. And I know the world is really truly for, for Lua for helping you down this path. Um, yeah, well, oh, no, please go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, the, the, it's, it's interesting to look back the further you come out from those, you know, from her being gone in that aspect of it. But, you know, we have it. Uh, one other story I'll tell you, which I think is really funny is, um, there was this, uh, painting I saw recently and it was a, um, kind of like a, was kind of like a, a snowy cabin and there was like a family around a fire in the front of it. And um, I know the artist and the artist had already done this like beautiful picture of Lua um, that she painted a long, a, a long time ago. And cause we, uh, me and, and um, Jacqueline and Roxanne um, 
Jacqueline, I guess for people listening, Roxanne uh, Stone and Jacqueline Hill had really helped her dog at the time. And I, I can't believe I was the only one that took her up on the free painting, but it is an absolutely incredible painting. So I saw her that she did this painting and I contacted her and I was like, Hey, can you do this painting? But like my family in front of it around this fire, like I would love to put that up in my house, you know, cause I noticed the dogs were her dogs and they looked, you know, perfect. And, and so I was telling Emily, I was like, oh, I've commissioned this painting. I'm going to do this. And she's like, yeah, but Lua has to be in it. And she has to be more prominent than Huckleberry. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> give the guy a chance. <laughs> Aww. So I think she'll always be, you know, number one to us. But we, we but Huckleberry has just such a great different. He's the family dog. You know, he's all of our dog. And I love him because he plays with toys like a mad like like a maniac and he wants to play with us and it's just a totally different experience and we wanted something that was different we didn't want to you know we didn't want another lua there's only one lua so it's it's fun to and and he teaches me new things all the time ironically he doesn't do well with raw dairy so if you can imagine me having a dog that just doesn't but it forces me to look at his nutrition differently and i had to sort of like take a protocol that i'd been used to doing and do it without dairy. And I learned a lot through doing that. And so I think, you know, he's the right dog at the right time. That's incredible. And I didn't, I, I don't know how I missed that. Cause I know you post a lot, his, his meals and everything. I don't know how I missed that, but uh, because that was actually one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is raw dairy because so it's been a number of years ago. Now my dog was eating a food that um, people know you for. And then mm -hmm. I switched her off of that food at a certain point in time and her ears immediately like were red and inflamed and it was, a, you know, a fermented food. And so immediately like her ear, she, I was like, okay, we're not doing well <laughs> without this food. And I, I, a light bulb went off in my head and I said, okay, I need to get, let me get some raw goat's milk. And I did that. And within 24 hours, her ears were back to normal and she mm -hmm. was back to normal. Everything was great and wonderful. And it has been a staple of her diet ever since. So it's like one of my go-tos whenever I'm talking to anyone, I'm like, well, we need to get raw goat's milk in your dog's diet. Um, and I know that it, like you were just saying, it's such a staple for everything you've done up until apparently Huckleberry. <laughs> Um, so, but yeah, like for me, it's just like a go-to, like we need this. And even a lot of dogs who do have dairy sensitivities, a lot of times still can have raw, raw milk because it's the pasteurized milk that they really are having the sensitivities to is what I'm seeing. Um, and, and there are so many different things we can do. I know you have different protocols to even be able to ferment the raw goat's milk that we get like from green juju, which is incredible. A couple of the questions I had for you about raw goat's milk is like, why I'm sure there's a very long explanation, but why it's so incredible. It's mm -hmm. like a really, it's, it's like a perfect food source, right? <laughs> and right. why it's so incredible, why dogs do so well on it. And, um, why? So one of the things that I have recently been learning uh, with TCVM, with tr traditional Chinese veterinary medicine, is that warm milk is thought to calm the spirit and relieve anxiety. So one of the things I wanted to ask you is if there is a way to warm the raw goat's milk without destroying any nutritional properties? Well, okay, so the, the, uh, a couple things. Number one, you've probably, if you've seen my pictures of Huckleberry's food, you've probably seen milk on there because it, it was a process to figure out. I tried literally every avenue by which you could do it um and he's just an interesting french bulldogs are just a quandary uh and i mean he's a he's a, he's a third generation raw fed french bulldog and um was born on a farm and you know raised in in and out of barns and the, and so he's definitely he has a completely different body he looks just like a different type of dog so he's healthier i think than almost every french bulldog i've almost ever seen but He's still a mystery to me in, in a lot of respects. Um, when it comes to that, I think maybe that's just like God's joke or something. 
uh, <laughs> giving me the dog without that doesn't do well in dairy because it's a very very rare situation when a, when a dog can't do raw dairy. Um, it's hands down the most interesting food on the planet. I mean, most people like their only experience with it is in the human world. And, and basically what happened in the human world, in my opinion, was people were drinking obviously raw milk, which is going much better for them, but then pasteurization was invented. And so instead of, uh, maybe taking the cows out of confinement areas and swilled areas, we said, Oh no, we'll just do that and pasteurize the milk versus, you know, putting them out on pasture. And the data is very clear when it comes to that. I mean, there was a, big study where they took thousands of samples from dairy meant for pasteurization and dairy meant for raw consumption. And 30% of the samples for pasteurization were uh, contaminated with pathogens. 0% of the samples for raw milk were not because it's just a completely different um, method of cleanliness and, and room for these animals to actually um, go around. Then we started to be afraid of fat. So we started to make it 2% milk or 1% or even worse skim milk which is, and sorry to all you skim milk drinkers, but the, <laughs> the dumbest concept, the idea that, and I grew up on 2% milk, so I get it. But once you take all the fat out, you're taking all of the valuable vitamins, you know, away as well um, to be able to do that. And so now I feel like in human nutrition, you know, most of the time you hear that like milk is inflammatory or milk is meant for the species the, the the biggest misconception is that milk is is only meant for the species um that it's made by and it's not consumable or shouldn't be consumed by other species the idea that there's the idea that because animals in nature don't drink milk and we do it's not natural and therefore it's wrong is a logical fallacy it's a naturalistic logical fallacy and so you have to go on the actual science of how to um, is it digestible? What are the nutrients? And one of the things a lot of people don't know is that all milks, doesn't matter if it's breast milk, camel milk, dog milk, cow milk, goat milk, it's all made of exactly the same stuff in different amounts. So like we're in goat's milk is 50, I think it's like 54% of the fat is um, medium chain fatty acids like acrylic and capric acid. Uh, in cow milk, you're going to have less medium chain fatty acids and more butter fat. Um, but they're still both going to be in there. They're just in differing amounts or human breast milk has more whey than cow's milk, that sort of thing. So it's all very, very applicable to really any species that's drinking it. It just depends. I think dog and cat milk is actually higher in protein and that's really the main difference. Um, I'm not sure which of the two main proteins it's higher in, but, um, so that's why it's so applicable. And that's why the other part I love about it is, and I'm obviously have experience in formulating complete and balanced diet and ideal and product formulation and know what that means, you know, in terms of how do we reach those levels. But my favorite thing probably about milk is that in no way would it meet an AFCO complete and balanced profile and no way would it meet an NRC profile. But I've seen animals live off raw milk and water for more than five years. And it's because it's not always about the amount of the nutrients, it's about the bioavailableness of that. I don't know if that's a word, but the bioavailableness <laughs> of the bioavailability of, of that, you know, that ingredients, it's sort of like comparing animal protein to plant protein. It's just not comparable in terms of the, the body's ability to use it. Um, and so it just contains, so it contains so much stuff that we discover new stuff all the time. So we always discover, you know, there's thousands of nutrients. There's every digestive enzyme. There's hundreds of different lactic acid bacteria that are made to set up in the gut and that all of the prebiotics you need are in that, um, in the, in the milk itself. It, 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 it's the most diverse fat. It contains over 400 different fatty acids, all of which do something different. And a lot, sometimes we don't even know what everything does in milk. We just know that it's there like, you know, you know, for a purpose. And so, um, it's really the only food that was developed to be food by evolution, which is really interesting. So like, you know, you have all this, um, all this, you know, 
millions and millions of years of honing in on and that's why I think it's so interesting given what I've just said about how everything's made out of the same thing and you know it's made specifically by evolution that people would say like well milk is bad for you well I feel bad <laughs> then for all those babies out there that are you know consuming it on a daily basis because you know there's nothing that when I drink raw milk there's nothing that is different that's happening for me than it is for my daughter right so mm -hmm. That was a pretty impassioned uh, soapbox there, but hopefully that got the point across. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And I hope you are not tired of talking about raw milk yet, because obviously that is just like what everybody comes to you for, right? True. And, and you know, when we got the ability to release it with Green Juju, it was just such a cool thing. You know, um, I don't think we knew we were going to do that, um, but we work with the best farmers in the world. And... You know, it's just the other really cool thing that we were able to do there was sort of marry the best quality because, you know, all of our milk is we sell it for pets, which is a good distinction to make. But we go through the the sort of so basically in the state of Pennsylvania, there's two pets. There's two certifications. There's pet sort of certification, which is basically like nothing to most degree. Um, and then there's human certification. So we are human certified. Um, which means that, you know, we could put it on a grocery store shelf here. You know, I live in a state where I actually on the way home here, I'm going to go to this little corner market and they have raw milk right on the shelf. And so, um, we married that with the best price point in the industry. We are like, uh, I've been out in stores, uh, on a couple trips the last few, uh, few weeks and we're like, for our half gallon of milk, we're three to seven dollars cheaper than our competitors. And that's a lot, especially now in terms of people's budgets and everyone I think is going through crazy stuff. I know our weekly trip to Whole Foods has become way more expensive. Um, you know, I that's a lie. We go more than once a week, but <laughs> I, any trip has become more expensive. So, you know, it's one of those things where we, we didn't want that to be a barrier if possible for anyone. Mm -hmm. So. And, you know, having been working with farmers for so long, we just um, knew that we could come in at a, at a competitive price point. And I know a lot of people have been doing a lot of price increases, you know, the last year. And, um, and rightly, to, to some degree, rightly so, because obviously the manufacturer's cost goes up. However, we really do do our best to keep the prices in reach to everyone. So, yeah. So, I personally switched to green juju goat's milk for my dog and I just, I order cases at a time because well, I don't like you. constantly making trips to, to the pet store. I'm just like, give me a case and I'll be back in a little while. <laughs> um, but one of the questions I had was like, is there benefit in rotating? Like maybe that's an unfair question to ask you considering you are a representative for green juju, but is there a benefit in rotating brands because you're going to be feeding milk from different goats that maybe well, feed on different things or I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. You're actually sort of self rotating when you even just use our product because okay. um, it depends. I mean, that's what the other thing that's so interesting about milk is you can look at the nutritional profile. It's going to be different for that goat, depending on when was the milk, you know, typically there's few, there's a few farmers who have figured out it's really hard to do winter milk when it comes to goats. Like they just have a typical cycle of getting pregnant in the spring and then they milk through about early fall, late fall. And then they freshen, which means they have a break, right? And then they continue that cycle over again. It's, it's pretty similar to nature, except there's milking longer. Um, okay. But so it really depends what what season, you know, when you get your case of milk, that could be multiple days of, you know, when we filled that up because we're doing it in smaller batches. So what that will be a bunch of different goats, you know, their milk is commingled together. What did all those goats, each individual goat ate something different that day? Did they eat a majority of the organic feed we do? Did they do more of the forage part of it? 
Were they outside longer that day, you know, for vitamin D content and that kind of thing? Were they, you know, eating hay in the winter? They eat a lot of hay versus, you know, that part of it. Um, what farm were they on? What is the soil like? So you're really doing a lot of um, rotating between those things um, there. And also, I will say, too, one of the things we don't talk about enough because it I was funny because I was in a store and this just occurred to me. I was like, oh, yeah, this is the case. Um, and the sales rep from the distributor was like, that's amazing. You should tell everyone that. And I was like, oh, that actually makes sense. So <laughs> the thing that really sets us apart in the industry from any other product is um, so our milking um, our milk parlor is in a barn um, that that's not exactly what sets us apart, but um, it's a very small scale operation. And um, the milk is the goats are milked um, when we order milk at like four or five in the morning, it's delivered about an hour or two later and immediately put into bottles. And that is completely unique to what green juju is doing. Um, a, a, most milks are, at least a day in the tank and then even longer than that. And ours are easily the freshest, um, which helps to sort of preserve nutrient content. Um, so, you know, the nutrition side of me says, you know, I'm happy if people want to, you know, people are take foods all the time, you know, that aspect of it. Um, and so, Whatever works best for the dog, I don't think that's necessarily a bad idea. Um, but I do think if people did want to, you know, stick with green juju, I do think that's one of the cool things about milk. You're getting the seasonality between all of those different things. Um, and with our, in our case too, you know, you're supporting about eight small family farms um, and allowing them to, you know, maintain their dream of being farmers full time and supporting their many, many kids because they're Amish. So, yeah, well, I do think we do need to support our farmers so much more than we, we do. Um, I am constantly telling my husband, like, we, we should just go to the farmer's market and buy meat. Like that's where we need to go. <laughs> um, but so you kind of touched on something that I, I actually did want to ask you very selfishly. I went into my pet store yesterday and I actually, I picked up a, an order of a bunch of the greens, the green, I, all the different, the blends, the just greens and the Bailey's blend and everything. And I was like looking through and I'm like, why there's no green juju goat's milk out. What's going on? And they were like, yeah, we haven't been able to get it. And I was like, okay, well, I mean, I'm okay right now. So it wasn't like too terribly concerned. Mm -hmm. And then she was like, our distributors have told us that like, we're not going to be able to get any goat's milk from any providers here soon because they're having a problem with lactation. And I'm like, really? And you said something about like the winter and that makes sense, I, I guess. But I, I'm like, is this an issue? Is this something that is that we know about? <laughs> like, it's definitely not an issue. Um, okay. <laughs> we have a lot of milk in, in storage. So uh, it was probably just, it was probably not that. I mean, sometimes it's like, telephone, you know, yeah. with, with why this happens. But um, it was probably just an issue with the distributor ordering or something like that. In fact, I think you're in Texas, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think, I think we actually just sent, maybe we're, we either sent or are about to send uh, a, a big order there. So you, you'll be totally fine. No, we usually buy more as the season is winding down to, to, to go, you know, into the winter part of it. Um, so you're going to be good with that. So don't worry. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was like, okay, because we know, well, I say we know, I think I know because I'm such a conspiracy theorist that, um, you know, the chicken feed are, is causing our chickens not to lay eggs. And I'm like, oh crap, is there something happening with our goats too? <laughs> You know, it's funny. I don't know much about the chicken feed thing, but I did have a, um, I was in North Carolina and I was talking to a store owner and he, he had, he had the similar experience with it. And I was like, Oh, that's so interesting. <laughs> um, I'm about to, uh, embark on my own chicken project, uh, in the spring. Um, 
awesome. very ner nerdy chicken project about, you know, testing eggs and, and developing feed types and pushing the omega threes up and things like that. And I will not be feeding uh Purina feed just out of, you know, Good. <laughs> yeah. for quality sake. <laughs> My whole thing was like, why are you doing it anyway? Like, yeah. it's just, why would you trust that company with anything when, you know, I go to AFCO meetings, so I see, you know, what, what companies like that are, are, you know, angling for in the food when they're on committee. So, you know, I, I just, to me, the whole thing was like, yeah, I understand there's probably like two big feed companies, but I hope that I don't eat eggs that are fed by Purina. Yeah. I mean, who knows? That's why it's like, if you go to the farmer's market, you can ask these questions, right? <laughs> like, what are you yeah, doing? Yeah, exactly. Chickens? Um, so, okay. To switch topics just a little bit to veggies. I actually, I thought I, I knew what I wanted to ask you about vegetables weeks ago. And then I did a gut health test for my dog and got the results. And my mind was blown. I say my mind was blown because like I knew all of this, but I was very like resistant. <laughs> I, my dog eats commercial raw mm -hmm. and I rotate brands and I rotate proteins and there are veggies in the food. Like there just are. And if I try to add veggies to her food, like whole fresh veggies, she will not eat them. <laughs> she's, she's very picky. And so I've never pushed it. I'm like, there are veggies in the food. No big deal. I got the test results back from the gut health test. And it's like, she needs more veggies and the, um, bacteria in her gut are, they're not horrible, but they are like, out of balance for sure, because she's just not getting that diversity in, in the, um, vegetables that she's getting in the, um, so that's why I went and I, I ordered a ton of green juju <laughs> because I'm like, Hey, we're going to add veggies. And I got the BAMS beets so we can add that every day for the digestive enzymes because it's a fer wild ferment, right? Is that mm -hmm. correct? Am I yeah. so, so I can get the digestive enzymes in her through the fermented beets and, and red cabbage. And then we're adding the veggies on top of that just to help with the diversity of the bacteria in her gut. And the reason I say I was like really, really hesitant about it. And this is one of the questions that I wanted to ask you. And now I'm kind of like re reframing it a little bit because I read a book called the carnivore code. It was for me. It's about human health and how mm -hmm. you should eat as a human. And when I implemented the strategies in the book, I felt so much better. And in this book, it has an index of studies that is just about as thick as the index of studies in the forever dog book, but they're telling you the exact like opposite things. The carnivore code is telling me it's got all these studies as to why we shouldn't eat veggies. <laughs> and then of course the forever dog book is, has all of these studies as to why we should be eating all these veggies. So, I guess what my question boils down to is like when you are looking at all of these studies and they are so conflicting, what makes you decide like, okay, yes, this is, we do need to use these veggies and we do need to try these with our dogs. And like, how, do, how do you figure all of that? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, well, I think based on my experience, both, you know, looking at human and dog nutrition, Everybody is so different. Every dog, every cat, every person is just so different in terms of what they need. I think that uh, sometimes people write books to prescribe a specific diet, but that diet type is not going to be particular to, you know, every, the one common out, uh, in, interesting thing. So, you know, when you look at traditional societies and, you know, for, if you look at like the traditional societies that Weston Price um, looked at, you know, pre-Western diet, the only commonality that they had was he didn't find any vegan society, any, you know, um, but aside from that, you had different um, ancient cultures, you know, uh, or I should say pre-Westernized cultures eating various amounts of plants versus you know, and then you, and then you get something like the Maasai tribe who are, you know, just drinking blood and fermented dairy 
as their entire diet. So, you know, I think it's just so different. And I think, I think we under, we downplay that with dogs. You know, this is one of the reasons, quite frankly, that I don't join any Facebook raw feeding groups because like, I think everyone wants to put every dog into their own dog's bubble. Dogs do need vegetables. They don't need vegetables. They need this fat ratio. They need all these different things when everything is just always going to be so fluid. And that's kind of the space that I operate in. I don't want to give you the answer. I want you, I want to give you the tools to find the answer for your own dog because your dog is different right now. I'm w when you did the microbiome test, was that the animal biome test? Mm, yeah. So mm -hmm. I will tell you right now is a little, uh, interesting um we have a big announcement coming with the animal biome next week um, we're going to be doing some really cool data collecting and uh some some really cool stuff with that and it all centers around the fact that you know i was at the holistic vet conference last year in um, florida and they did a presentation and they found exactly i smiled when you were talking because they found exactly what you said dogs fed raw diets don't have a diverse enough microbiome. That's absolutely true. Um, and they can show this by like looking at the species that they've identified in the diversity of species and uh, immediately clicked in my mind, like, oh, that's perfect for us. You know, in terms of we're, you know, rotating between all three of our products, you get 17 different plants into your dog's diet. And that's, that's enough right there. You don't even need to worry about it on top of that. Um, and so I think we need to take in as much information as we possibly can and then see what works for our dog um, or cat. And then because, you know, you can also go down a rabbit hole of who does this research, why do they do the research, you know, that. You have to go back. If you want to look at studies with food, a lot of times you have to go really far back, you know, um, back to like the, the 1950s and, you know, um, so it sort of depends. It's, it's sort of like, um, good example of that I eat a ton of animal products. So every morning for breakfast, I have uh, fermented raw yogurt and three raw egg yolks and cod liver oil. And a lot of people would tell me, oh, you shouldn't do that cholesterol and, and all these different things, but I've read information and I, and I also know what works for my own body. Right. Mm -hmm. And so this is what, you know, but um, someone else's diet is way different than that. So the main point I want to make here is let's leave some leeway to figure out what works. And that that's also in terms of the entire diet, that's vitamins, minerals. We don't need to, you know, um, I think that there's a limit on what we can know. And, you know, another comment that I hear a lot from people who are in like groups that I was talking about is people put a diet on and be like, Oh, well that's deficient in this. And it's not deficient in this. Well, maybe, but it also depends completely on, on, uh, how that animal was raised. Here's a good, here's a good, uh, example of that. If you go to the USDA database for, vi for eggs and vitamin D, you're going to find that that's about 6% of a human RDA, uh, vitamin D. Um, and that's what a lot of those formulation softwares are built off of. But when you, when you do dig a little bit deeper and do look into the studies of pasture raised eggs, you find that on average, the, a pasture raised egg has six times the amount of vitamin D. So that's a, that's a significant amount of mm -hmm. vitamin D to the total overall formulation for me or, you know, Huckleberry or something like that. And so we need to dig uh, and that can be said about all those vitamins. So I think we need to sort of dig a little bit deeper and figure out what works. And that, that goes back to the milk thing I was talking about as well. You know, when it comes to milk is not going to meet any um, nutrition, specific nutritional profiles, but it is the most complete food on the planet. So um, hopefully that is um, somewhat of an answer. I will say the case is now closed on vegetables. Um, it was a thing people used to say, well, dogs don't need vegetables. Need is another word that I don't really like because what does, what my dog needs in order to be healthy. The, the, the example I bring up a lot is if a senior dog does way better on Lewis golden paste, the turmeric, 
then they need, then if, if that dog can then jump on the bed, can run around more, then I would argue that that dog needs curcumin, that that is a needed nutrient. It's essential at that point. And you could say it about, imagine how many nutrients are in this, you know, it's not just the, the small amount that Africa is measuring. So, um, yeah, I would just say, I wish in, in our, in our, uh, in our little neck of the woods here in the nutrition side of things that people would be more okay with. This is what I do. And I'm okay with the fact that you do something different. Yeah, that's so true. And I appreciate that you said that because it is very like our dogs are individuals just in the same way we're individuals. So like what I, what works for me, isn't going to work for my husband or isn't going to work for you (laughs) necessarily. Um, And I think if we can relate it to ourselves, we can understand it. A lot of people can understand it a little bit better if they can relate something to themselves versus their pets. Me, I'm the opposite. Like if I understand it for my pet, then I'm like, oh, wait, this might work for me too. <laughs> but most people I think are, are the opposite. They're, they need to find it out. They need to figure it out for themselves and then they can kind of figure it out for their pets. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm, was really like, I heard you say, I think I heard you said, say this the other night that raw fed dogs especially need more variety in, in plants. And I was like, why is, why am I all of a sudden hearing this everywhere? <laughs> because it is true, I guess. But, um, why do you think that is? And what is that in comparison to? Well, what it is, is I think what we do is we always try to break down nutrition into its like most isolated, simple form and think like, okay, cool. This is going to be exactly the same thing. So, you know, we can, there are, there are efficient ways to use, say, let's say you're using a fiber supplement with psyllium husk or something like that. And that's totally fine. And I think would work for some animals, but it doesn't replace multiple sort of fiber types from different food sources. And that's really what they also evolved to eat as well. We know that dogs, we know that wolves eat plants all the time. Um, obviously they're carnivores and they still eat, you know, majority of their calories because calories are much greater in animals than they are in plants typically. Um, but, but we know that they're getting this diversity of fiber through those things. And, and, um, we know that. So, there's just a big difference in terms of, again, that diversity between say you did the 17 plants and then you're getting, you know, your broccoli, your kale, your dandelion greens, your, and the other thing we don't think about, which, you know, this is just speculation, but it also, you know, obviously whole foods aren't a fiber supplement. They have different benefits as well. So it's, you know, you're getting the antioxidants, you're getting the vitamins, minerals, you're getting so food is always the system. So we don't even know how the minerals or the vitamins or the antioxidants affect how fiber, we don't know if they affect how fiber is, is processed in the gut. But that's why we always, that's why, you know, for me, I always revert back to nature because that's it, that's, that, that's fiber in its most sort of primitive, like whole food form. And so I think when we don't know something, the best thing to do is go back to what we sort of do know. Uh, But I think a lot of that is coming out of um, not only us talking about that because of some of the stuff Animal Biome's doing, um, but we also know this is true in humans as well. There's actually studies that show that the more, it doesn't mean that like in a dog, I wouldn't, I, I'm not claiming that dogs need a majority of their calories to come from plants. I'm, I, it still should be a smaller amount, but it should be a diversity of it. And it's the same thing with people. You know, I, um, I think it was the one study that I'm thinking about showed like 30 different, you know, a diversity of 30 different plants was a, had a big effect on how the microbiome functioned. Um, which I'm guilty of because I know that we we cook at home most of the time, but you know, with a young child, it's like you make what you can. And so a lot of times our side is just a large amount of uh, steamed broccoli with raw butter on it, which is delicious. And it is very full of fiber, but it's only one food, you know? And so there's other, yeah. other things I eat, but the lucky thing is we can do it a little bit easier with our dogs because our dogs really have no choice, you know, in terms of, uh, <laughs> They don't get like, 
lured in by the Oreos at Target like I do. So it's, you know, one of those things. Oh, is that your weakness too? <laughs> it, it is. And actually they just released, I don't if if you're an Oreo person and have that weakness, they just released one called the most Oreo, which is like, is it like, like three times the cream or something? <laughs> yeah. And it's, and the cream itself is like ground up Oreos in the cream. Oh, I did I'm not sorry, need to I, know that. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry I did this to you. They are a- absolutely incredible. Uh, I'm a big 90-10 sort of person. You know, I, I I think we're trying to teach Maple that too. Like eat healthy foods most of the time, but just enjoy the ones that aren't because you've got to live your life. And, and um, luckily, you know, we can still... Uh, her favorite thing in the world though, which is absolutely hilarious is, um, raw milk with cod liver oil in it. That's her favorite. Uh, she didn't like chocolate milk, but she liked raw milk with cod. She loves raw, really? raw milk. With, yeah. I bought her raw chocolate. It was, it was raw chocolate. It was raw milk with cocoa powder and maple syrup. It's delicious. Uh, this local farm I do has it. And she did not like that. She likes raw milk with cod liver oil in it. Because that's what she gets oh, every my day. <laughs> well, I mean, good for her because, <laughs> like, I often wish that my parents had done stuff like that for me because it wouldn't be so hard now. <laughs> me too. But, I mean, she's going to get, she has, and it, you know, she is an incredible child in terms of, like, I give Emily all the credit in the world because she did a two year diet leading up to being pregnant. And, you know, while she was pregnant, she took six cod liver oil pills a day and would basically ate everything you're not supposed to. So raw dairy and sushi and, you know, all these very, very nutrient dense foods, but maple has been, you know, it was part of the reason we're only having one. I, I feel like, you know, she's been, it's being a parent is tough, but like, I mean, she's, she's never gotten had digestive issues. She's never gotten colic. She's never, she's always slept through the night. Like even now she goes to bed at eight and wakes up at about nine or nine thirty every single day. And she's only woken up a couple times in her entire life when she was sick. Um, and so I really attribute that to the nutrition of, of everything that we kind of, you know, prepared for in that way. And, um, and so I think the same can be said about dogs, you know, and once you actually like, if you have a dog or cat and you switch them to a fresh food diet um, or an unprocessed diet, and then you just kind of watch that transformation, I think you can see the exact same things. And I think we all need to start at food, 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 and then move to the supplements if we need to, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, that's why I said I I went immediately and placed an order for all the greens and the Bam's Beats because if I can implement the, you know, huge variety of vegetables and the digestive enzymes through the fermented beets, then I can test again and see where she's at. And if I don't have to add supplements, then all the better, right? Like, just do what you can with whole foods. Exactly. Well, actually, um, yeah, we would probably be, um, interested in that data. If you do test again, just throwing yeah, that out oh, there. I, I absolutely am going <laughs> to test again. <laughs> well, I mean, I need to know what, what, what's helping and what isn't right. So the only way to know that, I mean, I can look at her and see like, is she losing weight? Are her stools yeah. better? Does she have less gas? Blah, blah, blah. But to test again, and actually see where the bacteria levels are at. That's, that's the best indicator of it is what I'm doing working. They, they do some really amazing work over there and um, their fecal transplant pills are uh, incredible. And uh, you know, I, I have told this story before, but I was so excited to tell Holly, the, the, um, you know, the head scientist over there that, um, that I, you know, I try to, when people, people email me all the time about fermenting the milk, cause we have a video on our website that shows, you know, how to do that. And enough people emailed me about those fecal transplant pills that I was like, yeah, I'll try it. It's fine. And, uh, and I could see when I was telling Holly this story, she's like, I know where this is going. And, you know, I, I put it in my 
yogurt maker and I put two of the pills in there and, um, it keeps it at a hundred under 104 degrees. And so it's still in a raw food state. And I remember putting the pills in and being like, oh, this is, wait, this is just poop though. Like this doesn't seem like a good idea. So I <laughs> fermented it. I fermented it in there and it, seven hours. So I was going to do 24 hours for at a hundred degrees, which is pretty standard. And after I kept noticing the lid kept coming off because the bacteria start breathing and they start coming off. It's not uncommon with like my yogurt and stuff like that. And I kept pushing it back on. And then I told Emily, I was like, I'm going to go check this out. And, uh, she heard me in the other room say, this is a mistake. No one should do this. <laughs> and it worked really well. Those, those capsules are full of viable bacteria because I kid you not in seven hours, it turned to poop cheese and was the oh. grossest thing you've ever seen smell? in your life. It smelled very bad. It smelled okay. like you can imagine. And the, the way had completely separated and it was actually hard cheese. And I've never seen anything like that. And I, so I tell people like it works, but don't do it. And I told uh, Holly that, and she was like, I'm trying that. And I was like, at your, own, <laughs> at your own peril. Cause, but it just goes to show you that, that it's a great way to confirm whether your probiotic actually works is, is stick it in the milk and let it grow. And if it, if it's, you know, if it grows, then it's not just a powder. It's actually, you know, the stuff you want. Yeah. I've used the FMT capsules for my cats, um, but not my dog. So we'll see how things go after I test her again. Um, because of, you know, they always recommend them. Yeah. <laughs> Kelly, um, Kelly did, has done that several times, I think with Bam and has gotten really, really good results with that. So, um, That's yeah, awesome. the, uh, we're excited to, to work with them on our, on our big upcoming projects. So. Awesome. I'm excited to learn more about it too. So I want, oh my goodness, we're already in an hour. Thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate you. I did have one other question, if you don't mind. Yeah, I no problem. remember at some point in time, you were talking about a muscle wasting protocol that you had developed. And I have gone back through like every video I can find on Facebook and I haven't found it. And I'm like, I know I'm miss I don't even remember who you were talking to. Um, but I was very interested in it especially because I don't have any carpeting in my house. So I'm like, as my dog ages, she's nine now. I'm like, I need to know this. Like I need to tuck this information away in the back of my head. Yeah. I'm trying to think of it too. I'm trying to think of like what you're, you're sending me way back in time here. I'm trying to think yeah. about what that protocol even was. I mean, I did definitely give you some ideas when it comes to that um, <laughs> just in general, but um you know what? I don't know offhand what that was. Cause I remember we did a fr uh, initial round of health protocols and then we did, um, I did like the rest of them, um, like half the, the half of the next batch. And I'm trying to think, honestly, I don't know. Um, so sorry about that. I, I apologize. Okay. Um, but I will say one of the best things, you know, as animals, as dogs grow older, and they're dealing with, you know, losing muscle mass and, and even, you know, clinically dealing with something like that. Uh, my number one go-to is bone broth, large is amounts of bone broth. Yes. And that's because everything in bone broth is in free amino acid form, which means it's more usable than just eating meat. And the kidneys don't have to filter out any waste in that process. And so like, I even get my dog ready. Like he's 25 pounds. I do six ounces of the bison bone broth every day. So it's only six grams of protein, but those, those grams of protein are much more efficient. And especially in senior dogs, the more you can do that, the more you can sort of reduce their need for protein because they're getting the efficient source of it. So like eggs is another good one, um, which eggs are the most bioavailable protein. So on the protein scale, they're a hundred and everything else is below them. They are the standard. So that's another really good one. Um, and then obviously you can just kind of like put those into the diet. You know, how I feed Huckleberry, um, typically he gets like two to four egg yolks a day um, with his food. And I just, I just put that into the amount of calories. 
Um, and it just depends on what you want to do with, uh, whether it's, I, if you're dealing with what you're talking about, I would do the whole egg because you want the protein from obviously both the yolk and the white. And the white is where a majority of the protein in an egg actually is. Um, okay. so I think it's like four out of the six grams, it's like four point something in there. Um, so I think you could just build a pretty standard diet and do a lot of bone broth and a lot of, um, and then some eggs, then you could see a pretty big difference there. Awesome. That's good to know about the kidneys not needing to work so hard as well, because I know, especially as, as pets age, well, especially with our cats, mm -hmm. they they really have, we have a really high rate of kidney disease in, in, in our felines and, of course, our traditional veterinarians, their their go-to is like, lower the protein, lower the protein, <laughs> which yeah. we generally don't want to do until like last resort. Um, well, but... if you're if you're working with people or your own animals, like if you're lo if you do lower the protein, increase the protein in bone broth it can be a really good thing. Milk is also a good thing. I mean, I'm a big advocate of when nature makes food like eggs and milk and things like that, it puts it in a ton of moisture. And so I'm a big advocate too of younger dogs. You know, if, if I could feed Huckleberry milk, he would be getting milk as like at least a quarter of his diet, just generally moving forward forever. Right. That's one of the things that, you know, I think why obviously Lua was so healthy. I mean, the last year of her life, I was fermenting raw colostrum for her. And that was like the mainstay of her diet. I think that gave her, you know, a lot more time with us. And so just even starting that with any, you know, and we do bison and duck. Um, the bison broth is my favorite just because it, it's really nice and thick and, and has, you know, you can see the collagen in it. It's it, the quality is, you know, unlike anything else in the pet food industry. Oh, and then the other thing is if you ever want to like, something to address. Um, there's a full class on Judy Morgan's site, but something to just address because we're talking about bone broth. There is no such thing as fermented bone broth. So I say that in any, any product that has a ferment that is say fermented bone broth, there's just a fermented element to it. You're just adding fermentation to broth. You're not actually fermenting the broth. That would be a, cultures do become proteolytic, which means that they process uh, protein and turn it into usable carbohydrates, but that's not going to happen typically in this case. So the, one of the cool things is uh, we have a 20 ounce um, uh, pouch of bison broth. You can add in say an ounce of any fermented liquid, be it kombucha or, you know, sauerkraut juice or anything like that and shake it up. And now you have your own fermented bison broth product. So that's kind of a little hack you can do at any time. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that so much because, um, I'm, I'm always a student. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, and I did want to say too, I really enjoyed hanging out with you and your husband in Vegas. That was pretty fun. Yeah, I really, I, I didn't want to take up much of your time because I, there were just so many people there. And quite honestly, I am such an introvert that I really have a hard time like going up and meeting new people anyway. I'm like, no, they're not going to like me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm like, I pretend when I do my podcast, <laughs> I just pretend to be somebody else. <laughs> Um, but really, yeah, no, I am such an introvert and it was really awesome to meet you as well and hopefully see you, um, at more events this year. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode and please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training, The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month 
for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, oh.